Hello and welcome to the Miss Mystic Podcast. I'm your host and spiritual auntie, Aliyah Lovely, spilling the hottest tea in spirituality. I want to thank you for being here with me this week as we dive into another topic that so many of you asked about. The big response that we had this week, I had a lot of questions from you asking about how to connect more with spirit. Particularly, we have a question from Mandy who asks, what are some ways to connect with past loved ones? I lost my dad unexpectedly, dreamt about the date before it happened. I asked him to come visit me as Blue Jays and I get regular visits for him. And then I have Sophie's question, which is how does one begin spiritual practice and start connecting with the spirit and beyond? So I got at least 20 questions about that this week. And so I think that that for the collective, that's something that we're really kind of intensively thinking about and focusing on. And I have several different ideas being someone who is a practiced psychic and medium. And the thing is, is that the idea of connecting to spirit seems to be one of a nebulous (laughs) uh, factor. A lot of times we think it's something that we don't have access to and it seems very stigmatized. And so there is a lot of times where we have this block where we're feeling very much so that we don't have access to this particular type of communication. And the first part of it to me is that we need to have such a deep trust in ourselves that when we do hear from spirit, it's not something that we question. The thing is not how do we connect to spirit as much as it's how do we actually listen to spirit because you're connecting to spirit all the time, whether it be to your spirit guides, to your angels, to your past loved ones, or to your higher self, whatever, doesn't matter. It is a constant connection that is our divine birthright that we have access to all of the time. It's just whether or not we're paying attention to it. It's kind of running in the background. And so you might get um, a little ping to go, oh, let, let me go this direction instead of this direction. It had no bearings on your day, but you may have avoided a very major accident. I know that in my life, I've made certain decisions and thought, mm, that's kind of weird. Why did I decide to go that way? And while I don't necessarily have proof that that way was better or not, I have seen later after the fact that, oh, wow, it was better that I went this way, X, Y, Z, whatever. I think you get the point from that connection. So to illustrate this, I'm going to tell you about a story that happened to me just yesterday. I was in my office and I had a, an entire content calendar of things I needed to produce that day. And instead I was in this mode of like, I really need to get all this clutter out of my office. Like in order to get in a space where I feel like I can connect to the energy that is supposed to be this content creator, I need to be in my, I need my space to be clean. And so I go through and I'm starting to clean in like deep clean, right? Like not just moving boxes out of the way of my site, but like cleaning them out, things that I don't need anymore, putting it in boxes, whatever. And while I was doing that, I went through, I moved a desk around, I moved my setup around, and I went into this old box that had a lot of um, stuff from 2021 when my daughter was born. And I found this numerology reading from Karen Goodson, who, if you look her up. She's an incredible numerologist. And I started going through the forecast that she made for me, not only the forecast that she made for me, but the forecast that she made for my daughter. Now at the time, my daughter was maybe a couple months old and now she's two years old exhibiting the very behaviors and structures that Karen had talked about. And so I got on the phone and I thought, you know, I should let her know that this is so relevant to me today. And that our year at a glance was so prevalent and so spot on according to the information that she had given me. So I get on my phone and I text her and I say, Hey, I'm going to leave you a voice message. And I left her this really nice voice message, just telling her like, this is something I really connected to. Thank you so much. And she says, Oh, I'm at a fair right now. Now there is a fair that I have applied to be at in our local city, Kansas city, the Casey mystic fair. And I was like, oh, I bet she's at that same fair. So I texted her, are you at the KC Mystic Fair? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to come to see you. So instead of just doing what I was supposed to do today, I decide I'm going to go to this fair instead. And I'm going to check it out because I'm supposed to go to, I'm supposed to participate in this fair in August. So I'm going through and like, okay, I'm essentially abandoning all of my obligations for the day to go up there and see Karen. Uh, And I go up there. And there's all these little synchronicities that start to happen, right? If I tell you all of them, the story will be far too long, but there's this, this moment where I'm speaking to Karen and then she's like, let me show you, introduce you to my friend over here. And so we go into a different area. We end up finding that friend, which then leads to 
me standing in a line, which is to a gallery that someone's about to do a mediumship gallery. Now I have never done a mediumship gallery and a gallery means that you're standing in front of a bunch of people while pulling from them and talking to your past loved ones. Essentially a medium stands in the front and people view just like in a theater or something. And I'd never been to one. I had been offered to do one before. And I was like, I'm still not super comfortable with those kinds of things yet. Uh, Let me check it out. So I'm standing in this line with this group of people who are super excited to hear from spirit through this particular medium. And so I sit in this room and I'm thinking like, oh, wow, like this is really incredible to not only be around this many people who are really longing to hear from spirit, but to also feel myself what the medium is picking up. And that was really crazy. So I was sitting there next to a woman who essentially was matching lots of the things that the medium was pulling out. And there were details that she was asking about that I instantly knew the answer to before she'd spoken them. And I was like, wow, that's really like confirming and validating for me that it's like, I knew intuitively that these were the answers or these are the people that they were connecting to all the while at the same time, really wanting to connect with my own family members and hearing from my own family members saying like, you already know how to do this. So you don't need this. Let these people (laughs) hear from their loved ones. And I was like, that's not fair. Um, but either way, that's funny. So I have this, this beautiful, wonderful aunt who passed away suddenly last year. And at the end of the reading, she starts to bring up someone who fits a lot of the characteristics of my aunt. And I was sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, like it's going to happen. Maybe, maybe it's going to be, maybe I'm going to be able to hear from this person. All the details don't fit. It ends up being for someone else. And I find myself walking out of that room feeling really bummed, like kind of like, ah, I really wish I was able to connect in a different way than I normally connect to spirit, hoping for that validation and for that confirmation. And I was, as I was feeling that feeling, I could hear in my, inside of myself, my aunt saying, I'm near, I'm near. And when I look up from my phone, I see a woman approaching me who looks exactly like my aunt, like exactly like And it was probably also the hotel recess lighting, like whatever that made her her face look even more like my aunt. But there was this moment where I was like, it was almost like a mirage where I was like, whoa, I had to blink several times. Like, am I seeing this correctly? This woman looks so much like my aunt. She's walking towards me. She's one of the caterers and she's pushing some food and she's got on some gloves and stuff. And as she approaches me, I just, I stop her (laughs) and I say, I I know, I know this is probably kind of weird, but you look so much like my aunt who's in spirit. And, and she was really kind about it. She shook my hand and she just kind of looked at me and I thought like, let me take a picture. But I was like, no, that's too invasive. Don't do that. (laughs) Um, but there was just this moment where I was like, wow, like it's like I'm with her in this moment. I'm connecting with her in this moment. And it does not feel like an accident. It feels so like I was so emotional. I was brought to tears being able to almost see my aunt in the physical in front of me. And so I let her go about her day because, you know, she's at work. (laughs) And I stepped to the side and I started to cry a little bit because I was like, this, this is what I was asking for. This kind of connection. I was looking for a sign that my aunt was near. And here comes this woman who looks exactly down to the red hair, like who looked so much like her that, I mean, my throat is even getting froggy. Like (laughs) I, I just, I couldn't believe that it showed up in that way. Now it'd be really easy for me to say, nah, that was just a coincidence. Nah, that was just, you know, oh, okay. She happened to look like that. Maybe that was just something I was seeing to explain it away. And that is what we do all the time. We do it all the time. So whether your uncle is coming to visit you in Blue Jays, your dad or whoever, like if your grandmother's coming through coins, if you're, you know, like ask for an outlandish sign if you'd like to, but either way, you must trust the signs that come to you. And what happens is that we often don't think that those are enough. So when we negate those signals, when we negate those signs, we push it away and say, this is not a way for me to connect with you. Find another way. And oftentimes our spirit guides, our loved ones, whoever are trying to find other ways for us to connect and acknowledge that. And we continue to push them away. Part of it is fear. You know, part of it is that stigmatized, like I'm probably making it up. Part of it is like, you know, maybe I I don't trust myself. I don't believe what's happening. And part of it is that, you know, we're still grieving. We still feel like 
uh, in a way that we've lost this person and we don't know what to do with those emotions. We don't know how to process those emotions. And in some ways, sometimes we then over compensate and we're like, everything is a sign from that person. And you hear your other family members or go, oh, sure. Okay. Whatever. It's the gamut. It runs the gamut. Okay. But either way, spirit is always connecting with us. It's just whether or not we decide that that is an actual sign and that we'll take it for what it is. The other part of it is that we look at the world that we live in. Our world is filled with signals and signs. But when I say signals, it is the, the signal of your phone, the text message going off, the email, the call that you need to catch up with, the Instagram scroll, the movies, the advertisements, the, you know, it's like we are in constant stimuli. And for us to detect signs from our loved ones, or at least hear the subtle voice of our intuition and the loved ones and or spirit guides that are trying to get through to us, it's, a, it's more subtle than that. And we have constant, all of these blaring signals that are kind of um, flooding our input constantly. So it is almost necessary for us to cultivate some type of practice of quietness, some type of practice of meditation. Now, I know some of you are like, I can't meditate. I don't know how to meditate or whatever. I think that a lot of us are trying to meditate with the expectation of something. Like I'm supposed to hear a voice. I'm supposed to feel something significant. No. That, um, yes, that does happen, but that shouldn't be the goal. The goal should just be to be quiet, to just be quiet or sit in quiet, sit in silence, sit without stimuli. And for a lot of us, we, that's when our internal monologue starts going off and we start hearing things. We start hearing like, oh, I need to get this done. I need to finish this. Your anxiety pipes up because it's the first time we're actually listening to our inner voice. And what I say is, is that if you're going to sit in quiet, listen to all of those voices that are coming up until you can't hear anything anymore. Let it just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk until there's nothing else to talk about. And now you're actually truly in silence. Giving yourself that space where you have reduced the amount of stimuli and the amount of input that's coming into your nervous system helps you come in better contact with the subtle voice of spirit. So if you're like doing cards or if you're journaling or any other moded out any other modality or divination practice, there's going to be a cultivation of silence that's needed in order to train your nervous system or your brain, your reticular activating system to notice when those smaller voices come in and telling your brain that this is important for me to listen to. If you are in that high stimuli type of environment constantly, then your brain doesn't prioritize those smaller voices, those quieter voices. So you're going to have to cultivate a practice of quiet. Now, some of you may be familiar with the practice of meditation and that's fine. But to me, like started with me journaling. I started with automatic writing. I would first write a question and then just write whatever came to me. And if I didn't hear anything immediately, I would used to write duck, duck, goose that that goose, that that goose, like over and over and over until something started to flow out of me. And that's actually how I learned how to channel. I think I'd always been a channeler, but it was the first time I recognized like, wait a minute, there's like really intense wisdom coming out of these answers. And I don't think I knew those innately, you know, somewhere in my higher spirit, of course, or whatever, <laughs> but not based on my experience. And, um, one of the, one of the most impactful sp experiences I had with spirit uh, at the turn of my spiritual awakening was when I was in the kitchen having a conversation out loud with my spirit guides. And you ask, how am I doing that? Am I hearing it? Am I hearing? No, like I'm hearing it internally. Yes. As like you do with your inner monologue. I just learned that there are some people that don't have inner monologue at all. And so I'm not really sure how to advise them because if you don't have inner monologue at all, you might not have inner monologue that shows up as signs or as, um, vocalization from spirit. I'm not sure, uh, somebody will, should write me and tell me, yeah, actually I do hear from spirit, but I don't hear from myself. You know, I don't know. Um, but either way, there was this kind of internal talking that I was having in the kitchen. And I was asking spirit about a very particular situation where I was, uh, in the middle of looking for love, trying to figure out my love situation, whatever. And I know I've mentioned this before, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a very powerful example because I was sitting in the kitchen bemoaning, uh, this, the situation where I was unable to find love and spirit telling me we, if, even if we gave you the person that you're asking for, you're not ready to receive them because you would have thought they were too nice. And I 
was like, what? You would have thought that they were too nice and that would have turned you off and you wouldn't have been attracted to them because they are an emotional available person, which meant that you wouldn't be able to earn their love. Now, that was not information at the time I had access to (laughs) about myself. And it was this unlocking of like, whoa, I'm not able to manifest what it is that I want because I'm actually not ready for it. I would turn it away. I would feel it was yucky or something because it's not, it wasn't attached to the way my ego needed to fulfill its worth. So, and spirit told me that just flat out, like as, as blunt and as brash as possible. And I remember thinking, wow, like I literally sat in my kitchen and decided that I was going to have a conversation with spirit. And thus I did. So it wasn't like I had to do anything crazy or ornate in order to call in that particular information. It was just me asking the question and then me being silent and listening. Connection to spirit is deeply about listening, opening ourselves up, opening our ears up, quieting our own internal voices, quieting our external voices, and taking the time to receive. And we are not very well practiced in that motion. We are always in the output. I have to do something. I have to make something happen. I have to go after something. I have to produce something. And that's not where spirit lives. That is where our human lives. And that's beautiful and wonderful. I don't think that that should necessarily change, but there has to be an N word, like a breath in the way, the same way that we breathe out, you have to breathe in the same way that we put out stuff, information, voice, stimuli, we need to receive as well. So connecting with spirit in that way is, I think, really powerful because it says that they're never very far away, that we just need to tap in by listening, letting ourselves listen. Now, for those of you who are really trying to connect with human loved ones, I always think that it's easier to connect with spirit guides than it is with our human ancestors. I'm not sure why, except that with our spirit guides, we don't have any kind of like bearings on the validity of who they are. So it doesn't feel like it's... um you know, it doesn't feel like it's as vulnerable somehow, but when we're connecting to our human loved ones, those who have passed, we have very strong identifiers and a strong connection to them that sometimes we really, really want it in a way that makes us feel like there's something to lose. And there's a lot of expectation built around it and a lot of validators. Like we need a lot of validators that this is the person that I'm talking to. So we put a lot of parameters and restrictions on it in a different way than when we're trying to connect with our angels, guides, ancestors, whatever. And so something that I noticed in mediumship is that when I'm connecting to a loved one, I really pay attention to my body. I tend personally, now this can be different for you, but I tend to get chills right off the bat when someone is around. And so I utilize my vessel, the body as a way of them showing me that someone is around an involuntary response that says someone is in my space. Someone is connecting to my energy. Someone is crossing my aura aura. And I feel that when I go to hotels and stuff like that or whatever, and I I make sure to boundary myself when I don't want that invited contact. But when I'm opening myself up and saying, okay, I'm ready to receive, this is how it feels. So that's the first signal for me. Feel free to use that if that works for you. Everybody receives it differently, but those are kind of like hallmark responses, right? Uh, The second thing is, is that 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 moves me to a place of stillness and quiet. Now, when I do it as mediumship, I do it as first, I try to connect into my body to see what is possibly the the gender or identity of that person. How do they present themselves? Because that's probably the first marker that most people associate with their loved one. Names are super hard to get. Uh, a lot of mediums don't even do names. I, I sometimes do names. It comes here and there, uh, but they're a little bit harder because of, I think the energy of names are just different. Uh, the next thing is, is that if they're your loved one, you know how they died. So it's not like you're trying to gather information about how they passed or whatever. That's how I gain evidence of this particular person. So if you are someone who's going into mediumship, I tend to get that in my body. I usually feel heaviness in my chest. I usually have, um, now that I've done so much practice with it, I kind of know what the markers are a little bit more innately without them being very physical. And that comes with ease after doing so many of them one after another. But if it's your loved one specifically, you know their energetic signature. And so what I've always advised my clients to do is have a picture out of them, you know, in your house, preferably the living room or the kitchen. 
Those are community areas. Those are usually areas where they can enjoy spending time together with you. Um, kitchen is like, uh, I know a lot of like grandmas want to be in the kitchen, you know, cooking and stuff like that. Um, generationally speaking, that will change as <laughs> I get older. Um, but having a photo of them out and putting a candle nearby, uh, setting up like a mini size altar, if you will, and lighting a candle when you want to fill their presence, letting them know, I am focused on you. I'm wanting to speak to you. I'm wanting to connect to you right now and, and being able to, I would like to fill your presence. Show me in this way. So the medium who we were sitting with yesterday said that one, one of the examples that her client said is, uh, um, you know, find something outlandish, not like a coin or a cardinal or something like that, which I absolutely agree with because those are a bit more general, but find something where it was like, if you, if you saw that thing, you would be like, you would know without a shadow of a doubt that that was them. And, uh, her example yesterday was a honey bun, like the little, little snack, <laughs> um, that, you know, she was in our house or something like that and running through or whatever. And she ended up pulling a drawer open and they had a honey bun there. Nobody knew how, who, how it got there, who bought it, nothing like that. And I have a ton of examples like that, where I felt like someone has shown up in a way that it was like, this was kind of outlandish. I asked for the sign. Um, some of you saw on my Instagram, there was a, a woman who I was doing a reading for and her aunt had spoken and said, look for the raccoons. And that to me was so random. I was like, ah, like I almost didn't say it because I thought like, this is, this is probably nothing. I'm probably just like hearing, making something up. Right. I probably didn't believe myself. And I told her that and she lost it because her aunt was a keeper of raccoons. She named all of them. She had all, you know, 20 years or something. And it was very specific to her. So it was a very outlandish sign. So if you're looking for a sign ask for an outlandish one, something obviously that's related and connected to them, but something that you wouldn't come across easily, not like a butterfly or something like that. And letting that being like really firm, validating evidence that they are connected and that they are talking to you. And I think that that helps us in our belief. We get more connected to our spirit people when we believe that they're there. It's like your spirit guides are going to be there anyway. <laughs> your loved ones are going to be there anyway, but whether or not you believe that they're there affects whether or not you're able to connect with them on your end. They're always ready and willing to connect, but it's just up to you whether or not you feel ready to receive that connection, open to, to that connection or feeling that that connection is real to you. So I'm not telling you to just believe in like random stuff or whatever that doesn't feel like it's, it's super connected, like not at all, but if there is any kind of disbelief or even fear of connecting, it's going to be hard to connect. It's like, think of, think of our spirit guides and our connecting people, our loved ones as regular humans in our world. If there are people that we are afraid of, we're not going to be close with them. If there are people that we have trepidation around connecting to, like in real life, like say, you know, you see some, some girl on the other side or whatever. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. Like, I just don't know about her. You're not going to make any motion to get closer to that person right? Like, and typically in our human world, it's usually to our intuition. Like, I don't want to connect with that person. That's different. But all that to say, maybe it's a bad example, <laughs> but all that to say, like, if you're really wanting to connect to someone, but you fear them or you fear that the connection isn't real, it's really, it makes it harder for you to connect to them. The last thing I'll end with is knowing that in the mediumship work that I've done, at least every single person that has come through is coming through with love. They love you, whether they're your spirit guides, your angels, your gods, your, your ancestors, they're coming through with love. The whole point of this whole universal earth experiment. And because they're coming through with love, they, that's the, the prime thing that they want you to know. They're not necessarily always the guides may be a little bit different because they are trying to guide us, but it is always with love. And so if you are in a place where you are in the spirit of love, loving them, loving yourself, loving your life, you're going to be a better vibrational match for the connection you're asking for. I'm not saying it's impossible to connect with them if you're not in that space, but it's going to make it easier a hundredfold. That I can, I can say with a surety. If you are a vibrational match to that high level of energy, then you are going to be in closer contact with those people you're trying to connect with. 
I know that when I do meditations and I clear my space and I clear my clutter and I'm in a really good mood, it is always easier for me to connect to the spirit guides with the very honest information that they're trying to bring forward and with my past loved ones than if I'm in a space where I'm being really negative about my life or negative to myself, mean to myself, unkind to other people, whatever. I'm not usually unkind to other people, but I'm super unkind to myself. (laughs) So that said, really, really trust yourself. Trust the information that's coming through. Don't deny it and ask for that connection and you'll get it. I'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in.